This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Cock Punch Coffee. Before we get started and talk about a little bit about why this coffee should be in your life and all the things it does, it's great coffee. It is really have, tasty coffee. I, I mentioned this last time. I get I try coffees. I'm always in search of the perfect coffee. Yeah, and also a lot of people gift us coffee because they know we love they coffee. Love it. And I have put it in the espresso machine and vacuumed it out. And down here at the gym, we have a nice espresso machine. I have literally dump the entire super special machine upside down to get rid of the vile coffee. This cock punch coffee is so good. So it was originally created by our friend Tim Ferriss based on a fictional world he created as a creative outlet. It was started, he did fictional writings, NFT art, podcasts, and now has released cock punch coffee. Yeah, I love this. It's high quality, lowest carbon footprint coffee. And more importantly, Tim donates all the profits, all the profits and the proceeds to his foundation, SESI. And SESI is a nonprofit that focuses on cutting edge scientific research and explores treating conditions that were widely considered untreatable. So you can get great coffee. I'm telling you, it's good. And you can change the world. Yeah, you can support it. It's coffee with a cause, which we are fans of. To learn more, go to cockpunchcoffee.com slash TRS and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase. We are happy to have Justin Rothlingshofer on the podcast today. From a young age, Justin has always been self-motivated to improve, developing the discipline and work ethic necessary to excel. At 13 years old, his father said, son, talent will get you noticed, but consistency will get you paid. And that set up his quest to, of founding Own It. Over the last 20 plus years, Justin has worked with Stanley Cup champions, NHL MVPs, Super Bowl champions, Olympians, eight, nine, and 10 figure entrepreneurs, and Fortune 500 companies. After completing his MS in sport performance and human biology, Justin sought out postgraduate work in functional medicine. He has worked as a performance director in the NHL and NC2A and founded a private camp for professional hockey players focusing on healing them from the inside out. He is an Amazon best-selling author for his books, Intent, Blueprint, and the Own It Manual. They focused on peak performance, human optimization, and applying data and testing to create personalized blueprints. Justin's latest book, The Power of Ownership, hit stores on April 23rd. Justin is a whirling dervish. He is <laughs> living this dream and talking about it. And one of the things that I really like about this book is that, again, given us data, we are need to be anchored in understanding inputs and outputs. We no longer can be like, yeah, I feel good. I, I should just eat the way I feel or I should exercise the way I feel. It's not working for us. Yeah, and I think what he's trying to do in this book um, is give people sort of the how to because, you know, as you and I have talked about extensively, people are being fire hosed with information. They're confused. Yeah. Um, and, or there are plenty of people who actually know exactly what they should be doing, but they can't figure out how to fit it into their lives. And so I think, um, with his work with own it and in his latest book, the power of ownership, he really is trying to help people, um, with, with almost a how to manual of actually how to fit some of these behaviors into the, your lives so that you can ultimately have more capacity as a human. I feel a lot of kinship with Justin coming from high performance and recognizing, hey, that's really important, but we've got to shift yeah. and be able to apply those lessons. And I think he's done such a wonderful job of, of sort of taking a framework out of high performance and then pointing it back to people and saying, hey, look, let's not play defense. Let's stop treating disease or sickness. Instead, let's really pivot open so we can open up your native capacities. Yeah, and I think capacity is sort of the key word and like the theme of this conversation. And I think if you're listening to this and someone who's hoping to figure out ways that your health habits or your, you know, the way you deal with stress can help expand your capacity as a human, this is a great episode. Enjoy our conversations with the amazing Justin. Justin, welcome to the Ready State Podcast. It is so great to be here with you guys. I, I, every time I see your faces, I just can't help but smile. Well, I mean, we can't help but smile, and we just were talking about the fact that you're tan in Miami in front of like a living wall, and um, Kelly and I are pale and sad right now, so was, we're excited to see you. I was talking with our daughter this morning in <laughs> Michigan. She's like, Dad, it's snowing. And I was like, well, that's, that's what you get when you decide to go out east, kid. That is true. Um, all right, so 
let's get right into this um, because we want to have plenty of time in this podcast to talk about your latest book. Um, but before that, I would love to um, get some get some background uh, going here. Um, so I think what would be great is if you could just start by sort of like giving us the state of the state of your life right now. What are you working on? What are you focused on? Um, just sort of a general state of the state. Yeah. So when I left um, the National Hockey League in 2021 um, and stepped out of the health and performance role and really stepping into what I th believe and have firmly come to just have this deep conviction on, um, which is my newfound mission to redeem the health of the world. It's really being able to change the way that we see health, change the way that we talk about health in a massive holistic way, because the conversations that are being had, if I take my step, my, my, if I take steps backwards in the strength and conditioning world, when it first was starting, it was, do you squat or do you deadlift or do you trap bar? Like, <laughs> like that, like which one is the best? And let's, let's have, and let's have a fight about yep. it. Yeah. Yep. Which one is the best? And, um, that now in the case and days, like in the health space, it's, is it paleo? Is it keto? Is it all meat? Is it all vegetable? Is it, you just get, is it intermittent fasting or is it, uh, eat small meals throughout the day? Is it sleep until 8 AM every morning? Or is it get up at five? Is it no stress or is it all the stress? And it's like, we're having the wrong conversation. It's like, it's not what is best. It's about what is best for me. And in my in, in my quest for redeeming the health of the world, if you take a look at kind of the space that we're in since 2014, there's been this continual decrease in the average lifespan of both men and women. We peaked at 2014 at 79.3 years old. And uh, ultimately, over the last 10 years, we've seen this chronic decline. Uh, today, men have an average lifespan of 72.6 and females have an average lifespan of 77.3. And well, I ha let me jump in because I, what I feel like is I know a lot of people who brag about their bench press in like college or in high school. And that was 2014. Like, ah, oh, it was peak lifespan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah that I was, was 79. Like, oh, no, back 2014. in 2014, I was 79. Yeah. yeah. Holy moly. But now I've, I've, you know, I started drinking and smoking and not sleeping. So 72. And, and I've, and I've just seen this decrease. And, the biggest thing that we that we have to realize is there's more influencers, there's more information, there's more doctors, there's more experts, there's more books, there's more conferences, there's more workshops out there than ever before, but we're sicker than ever before. Right. It's not working. And it's time to do something different. It's time to lean into something different. And so for me, I, I took all of that education, all that experience um, from the National Hockey League. I did my postgraduate re doctoral research in heart rate variability and sleep and ultimately brought it over into uh, the world that we live in and ultimately helping to uh, educate, empower and equip people to take ownership of their health, not push it off on somebody else, not rely on a person, place or thing, but rather equip themselves to understand their own bodies, the key metrics that help determine behaviors so that we can now again, feel like we now know when we're healthy and where we need to actually start turning the wheel a little bit. I love it. Well, I think we'll deep dive into all of that um, when we start talking about the, your book, but I'm hoping um, you can kick this off a little bit because I think it will do wonders in our audience getting to know a little bit about who you are and what makes you tick. If you're willing, um, I understand that there was a time, I don't have a date or anything, where you gave a keynote speech in New York. Um, and I think that that was a, an important moment in your life and career. And if you're willing to share that story, I think it would, um, I think I, to me, it, it told when, when I read about that, I think it told me a lot about who you are and your character and motivation. So if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind sharing it, it would be great. Yeah. It's, it's about four months, five months after I left the NHL. Um, I had really kind of taken my, even before I dive into that story, I'll preface with a little bit to set the stage and the tone to understand like why that moment was so impactful and pivotal for me. Growing up in Canada, the NHL was like the epitome and the pinnacle for where I wanted to be, mostly, mostly as, a, as a player, as a young kid. I wanted to play in the NHL. Those weren't in my cards, but I did get 
brought down to the NCAA on a hockey scholarship that prefaced my my journey in health, wellness, performance. I ate it up. I was obsessed with it. It really kind of drove that uh, that journey for me, and made my way into the league as a health coach, uh, health and performance coach. At the end of the day, as I started to really manage the health, wellness, and performance of the best athletes in the world, I had failed to do that for myself over the course of a decade. And oh wait, wait, wait. you meant you became a professional coach? <laughs> that, that, that is true. <laughs> Especially uh, when I say professional coach, don't think of your local trainer, or your local CrossFit gym. I mean, welcome to the stress of actually being a coach at a professional team because yeah. it's real. It is full on. Oh yeah, full on. I, I mean, I was. I was fired three times. <laughs> I saw I saw my career come and go in the league three different times, not because you weren't doing your job, but because you just weren't winning. And so you realize what the stress and um, the, the time and the hours and the, the things that you carry outside of just, hey, can we keep these guys healthy? And when I stepped into the league, the unique part about this, guys, was it was 2009 and we had all we, we were still using data. We were getting data from the players. We were getting blood work. We were getting um, training loads, power numbers, metrics, testing. But it was all just sitting on a shelf. We were never utilizing it. Everybody trained the same. Everybody recovered the same. Everybody slept the same. Everybody traveled the same, ate the same, supplemented the same. But yet the owners and managers are wondering, why, why does everybody get the same sickness? Why does everybody get hurt the same time? Why, does we, why do we have the same trends in the league? Well, because we were doing the same things. And so my kind of, I guess, purpose of being in the league was really helping to transform that industry in using data to drive decisions, data to drive direction of where we actually went. And so over the course of this time, and I remember, gosh, finishing a game at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, then going back and watching game film, looking at training load numbers, looking at GPS numbers, and now correlating it back to different factors, and then having to then change uh, how we were recovering the next day. Like it was, I took it upon myself and just ran myself into the ground. Doesn't sound like you were optimizing your sleep. Not at all. Not at all. I wasn't <laughs> optimizing anything at this point. However, the coolest thing about hockey, everyone, is that it's all indoors. <laughs> yeah. In a cold <laughs> rink. In a cold <laughs> rink. I, I say I traveled the United States and saw all the cities in the world, but I, saw, I know their airports, their hotels, and their hockey rinks really well. Otherwise, not very well traveled. Amazing. No idea. Yeah. No clue. And so, as this was happening, um, I, I left the league. I still needed to uh, to compete for myself because I wasn't competing anymore as a player. And so got into triathlons and marathons. And so I say all that and I preface that because I was still competing at a very high level. Physically, I looked great. But headaches, nausea, irritability, brain fog inability to sleep, energy lulls, all things that I wasn't familiar with. Or, wait, 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 go back to you looking great. Cause that's really, I think that's like, the key. That's what we've that's put. A, it's like the key. That's the key. You in any right presentation, I, I, throw a, I throw a picture up. It's like this chiseled <laughs> guy holding the uh, High Rocks Games world record in 2017. And I hold this up and I'm like, that's what the doctors were looking at walking in saying, there's something wrong with me. They're like, no, you're the picture of health. This is what we want you to look like. I'm like, dude, there's something wrong. Like something is wrong with me. And like, yeah. And they're like, they're like next. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and, and so as I was going through this process, I, I still remember it's 2018. I was in Chicago, I was finishing up a workout and I picked up a medicine ball. I turned. And the last thing I remember was the room spinning. And I ended up walking into, uh, or the room spinning. And then the next thing I remember, I'm laying on a bed face up and I'm sitting there going, there is something wrong. And this is after seeing five or six docs, everybody telling me everything's okay, giving me every supplement under the sun. I'm just like, something's not right. Went to a specialist. They ended up finding uh, four polyps in my colon, all precancerous and an ulcer the size of a quarter in my stomach, also precancerous. And I knew at that point that I had to change how I was living. I had to change what I was doing. And that led to the call of what we're doing from a personalized health standpoint is not an athlete problem, but rather a human problem. And that year ultimately led to my leaving in, uh, in 2020, uh, when I stepped out of the league and said, Hey, now it's time to go during that year, I wrote the book blueprint. And this was all about how do I take what we're doing at the NHL level, this personalized health solution 
and put it now to everyone. And so as I left, I'm like, man, we're launching this book. This is going to be the launch of my career. This is going to be this next step for me. And I went out to New York City, uh, took out the Lululemon uh, headquarters uh, right there on Broadway and sent out invitations, brought in sponsors, had um, the uh, had some uh, film team there getting everything set up. I had, uh, Pat Davidson. He, he was lined up to speak alongside with me. Uh, he had a book come out a couple months earlier and we show up. It was supposed to start at 7 30 PM room looked great. 7 15 rolls around. Nobody's there. 7 30 rolls around. Nobody's there. 7 45 rolls around. Nobody's there. And I look to my left and my right and everyone's like, What's going on? Well, all of a sudden, a homeless man walks in. This is no joke. A homeless man walks in and goes, um, am I in the right place? And I was like, are you here for like the book launch? He's like, no, I'm looking for some food. And I was like, oh my God, like what is actually happening? And so nobody came, nobody. Like guys, zero, zero people showed up. 47 RSVP'd yes, zero came. And when I tell you that I was like embarrassed, I was mortified, I was pissed, like all of these emotions running through my body. And the guy uh, who was doing the filming looks at me and goes, well, what do you want to do? I said, there is only one choice and I'm going to present as if this room is full. And so I went through and I presented it all, did my talk choking back tears the whole time. And at the very end, the guy, I'll never forget, he goes, well, kid, I'm glad you got this because hopefully it'll keep you happy as uh, as your life goes on. And I said to him, one day, this room will be full. And he looked at me, rolled his eyes, he said, sure. And I went home, I bawled my eyes out. And th that was, gosh, what is this now? three, three years, three and a half years ago. And um, I now keynote all over the world on that book. And it's kind of led the way to this new book, The Power of Ownership, um, led to a three book deal with Wiley. And it's now just, it, it's very cool to see how persistence and believing in a mission and a movement is able to create change when you truly believe in it. Um, and especially when it's something that's so unique and so different. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it really does highlight this interesting thing is that people like the idea of high performance. They love the idea that something feels sexy and complicated and technical. Here we have a really brilliant coach working alongside good athletes, good athlete himself. And it's not enough. It's not enough to catch people's attention. It's not enough to change their behaviors. You know, this book, I can see in your evolution of helping people get to, and even for yourself, where you're going to interject behaviors into people's lives, which is part of the real magic is it is so difficult with all of the come at me, social, the noise to actually for someone to actually care and actually feel like they can ingest that. What do you think the difference is, you know, from that moment is it just that it takes a second to be really good at your job and or let people know or to serve people? And you were saying you basically had the a solution, but people didn't know you. I mean, I mean, for for lack of a better phrase, what do you think it was? Yeah, I mean, I'll get truly honest and vulnerable here is it even at that point, it was still all about me. It was about my plan. It was about what I wanted. It was about um, getting my agenda out. The NHL was all about me. There was the hardest reason why I had to leave and why I, even though I knew my health was suffering, why I didn't leave was because I only saw my worth with the NHL logo on my chest and associated with the team. I didn't see it in what I was doing and what I was bringing and the impact that I was making. It was all about me. And the thing was, when I was humbled, like humbled in a big way, nobody shows up for something. That's that That's a big thing. The other thing I didn't talk about was um, after that book launched, COVID hit. And after COVID hit, you're talking about a guy that now just exited a league, doesn't have a job, 
the book launch did not go well. And (laughs) for eight months, I didn't have a job. For eight months, I, I was trying to figure out like, how do I reach people? How do I do things where this, this health, health thing and this truly health optimization thing, it was, it was not being talked about. Nobody wanted to talk about this. I just don't want to die because of COVID. And so I'm sitting here jobless for eight, nine months and trying to figure out how this whole thing comes together. And I still remember my wife and I went from New York city, uh, down to Naples, Florida, and I was, I'm angry during this period of time. Like I'm not a joy to be around. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of deep inner work, a lot of therapy. <laughs> and as I'm going through this, I still remember it was a Thursday. It was April 22nd at 2020. And my wife said to me, she said, Justin, I just need you to go get into a kayak and go be with God for a while because you're just, I can't be around you. And I said, I don't need to go in a kayak. I just need to figure out what I'm doing. And she said, no, just go in the kayak, please. And I went out in the kayak and typically I'm on my phone. I'm distracting myself, trying to bring myself into a whole bunch of different places. And I can't explain it any other than I just was kayaking. And it was like there was a sheet of glass in front of me. And there was like this little pinpointed bullet hole that had light shining through it. And instead of distracting myself, I almost leaned in curiously and it was like it spider webbed and I saw the glass fall. And I just had this moment of pure clarity and I pulled up my phone. I started to type. I started to type. I started to type. I started to type. I was there for about two hours. I went inside sunburned and dehydrated (laughs) and I copied and pasted everything. I emailed it over to myself and I printed it off on a Word document. It was about 22 pages. And it was the manifesto and vision for what own it is today. Now we're in iteration 17, 18, 19, (laughs) but it was the first moment of clarity of understanding how health can be done differently for people and how to reach them in a unique way. And that was, to be honest with you, the first moment, Kelly, that I was able to actually drop my ego, had nothing to do about me, had everything to do about how we were serving, everything to do about everybody else. And that energy and that space and that moment and that clarity is what started the trajectory to know that this has nothing to do about Justin. This has nothing to do about the system of what Justin is doing. This has every two thing to do about everybody who it's reaching so that they can now have ownership of their health do this thing differently than what the option of the world is presenting them and give somebody hope that ultimately has maybe had has maybe been hopeless for a long time because the symptoms that they've been suffering from have simply seems like something they can no longer overcome something that health isn't for them it's for somebody else it's for everyone else but now realizing that no i can take ownership of this i can know my data i can understand this thing it doesn't need to be scary and complex it doesn't need to be something that i need a doctor to interpret it doesn't need to be something that i am just at the mercy of these experts around me but no i can take ownership of this and i can understand this and that was really that first step I just want to, before you ask yeah. your question, I too had a moment of story kayaking. I know you did. That's I true. I was, that's, I literally, as he was saying that, I was like, well, I, that I happened to Kelly was, too. I was out surfing at Ocean Beach in my kayak and I was, I was like, I got to go to grad school. I saw all of this in a moment of story. So Viva, yeah, la, gets viva la Kayak dreams. Yeah, it's the, kayak, the kayak is the way. You know, uh, what I couldn't help thinking as well during that is that, um, you know, obviously, it, you know, COVID was a, a net negative for the vast majority of people and, you know, whatever, but. I, I also don't wonder if COVID hadn't happened, if you just would have jumped right into another job or, you know, just, you know, been, been, you mm. know, back into sort of the rat race and not actually had that moment to be able to think those thoughts and be able to come up with a vision. You know, I, I don't know if you think about it that way, but, but um, what I would love to ask about is I know that through own it um, and your books, you coach, you know, high level athletes and CEOs and couples, but you have this phrase you use called life by design. And I know that that's an integral part of, of sort of your philosophy, but can you tell our listeners a little bit about what does life by design mean in your universe? Yeah. So that's, it's really, really good. The, um, the cool part about, I think our, um, our company, our business, kind of the culture that we've created, 
um, now growing to a team of almost 40, is making sure that we have intention behind every single thing that we do. And when I think about the definition of performance, a lot of people, when I ask people uh, from stages or I'm workshopping or keynoting with people, I say, what is your definition of performance? And I hear things like winning, attaining goals, accomplishment, efficiency, results. And the, all those are great words. They're all awesome. But that's the worldly component and what we've been taught to think performance actually is. And so when we think about all those words I just said, they're all outcomes. They're outcomes of what it is that we're leaning into. And so mm. when, I disturb, when I talk about what health is and what performance is, I've come up with a different definition that we shape it around. And it's the capacity and desire to intentionally and consistently behave at a level equal to our potential. And so when I start to ask people, hey, what is your desire? Everybody has great desires. Everybody has great uh, things they want to accomplish. But at the end of the day, it's a capacity issue that people are dealing with. And the capacity issue that people are dealing with is because they're failing to act intentionally and consistently to ultimately reach the level of potential that they have been created for. And so when you think about this capacity component and this life by design component, intentional and consistent behaviors are the construct for what life by design is all about, is making sure that you can intentionally and consistently choose every single day what your behaviors and habits are. And it's not off of emotion. It's not off of feelings. It's not off of opinions. It's off of data data that drives your direction. So when we sit here and we know, hey, what is HRV? What does HRV stand for? What does HRV mean? What does it mean for me? Where is my body currently at? Go, go For people who don't know what HRV are, I mean, you probably have been in a cave. <laughs> but just take us back a little bit and explain that yeah. and then help and use that as an example of what you mean. Yeah, so there's, there's really... Before I kind of dive into that, there's really three constructs that we use or three data points that we make it super simple for people to understand where they're at so they, they can make intentional and consistent behaviors and live that life by design. So number mm -hmm. one is heart rate variability, HRV. The best definition that I'd be able to come up with with heart rate variability is it's the language that your body is communicating to you with to understand how you're adapting to stress and strain. Not being able to differentiate between mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, real, or perceived positive or negative stressors. Body's one goal is to keep us alive. And so heart rate variability is that key metric, that key number, that key indicator that's telling us, hey, are we adapting positively to the stressors in our lives based on habits and behaviors? Or are we not quite adapting well enough and we need to focus a little bit more on the rest and the recovery and the regeneration spaces of what we're operating in and so a higher hrv a higher variability is greater meaning we have greater capacity greater adaptation based on habits and behaviors a lesser number or a lower number is an indication just an alert that hey I need to I need to enter into a little bit more rest and recovery. So that's number one. Number two is sleep quality. If we can understand the quality of our sleep, we have four stages, slow wave sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, and awake cycle. It takes approximately 90 to 120 minutes to go through all four phases. And if we are between 40 and 50% of our sleep at night in REM and slow wave, that's an indication of high quality sleep where we're getting great mental recovery great mental recovery, great physical recovery, which in turn will also bolster and rise heart rate variability. And then number three is cellular deficiency. Understanding what vitamins, minerals, and amino acids you're deficient in at the cellular level, not blood serum, but cellular level. And once we're able to understand those three metrics, those three numbers, we now can take ownership and go, oh, you know what? The way that I've been eating hasn't been optimizing my cellular deficiencies, hasn't been working well within my system, isn't optimizing my sleep. Oh, this workout that I'm doing actually isn't helping me get to where I want to be, isn't increasing HRV, isn't increasing sleep quality. Oh, you know what? This 
breathwork timing that I'm doing isn't actually the proper one for me. Or, oh, this sauna and cold plunge protocol isn't working for me. Or these things, these fads that we start entering into, even though they're great for all the data shows that they're great for health, it's maybe not great for you in the season you're in. It's maybe not great for you in the time in which you're using them. It's maybe not great in the sequence in which you're positioning them. It's maybe not right for you in the time of your day that you're operating with them. Or maybe you're just trying to stack too much stuff into what you're trying to accomplish that is just adding more stress to your day when in actuality, doing less would actually be doing more. And so when you become empowered with this data, you get to live by a life by design. And it's not shooting for perfection. It's not meaning that we like, oh, we need the best HRV. We need no cellular deficiencies. We need the best sleep quality every single night. But rather... It's empowering you to realize the impact of your decisions, the impact of your choices every single day so that you now can be empowered, equipped, and educated on what choices you're making so that you can truly have ownership and feel good about the direction that you're going. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. And, you know, we have talked a lot about how much we love Momentus protein powder, both the whey protein and oh, the other proteins. But one, one of the things we haven't talked about very much, which is a big part of our life and we love, is the recovery protein. Yeah, think of all, all the great German milk, grass-fed cows, plus all the pre-digestive the enzymes. highest quality protein you can get. Then adding in a few extra things that just crank up recovery, including some carbohydrate. Because sometimes... I see you drink your protein, and I'm like, well, that's really great. You're hydrating, you're getting your protein in, but you also can right. stand to use a carbohydrate. And what's nice about this is it checks the box of needing to hit some carbohydrate to shuttle that glucose back in. For, look, if you're an average person who's like, I'm just going to go exercise once in a while, just hit your grams. But if you're really thinking, i got to go hit it hard again tomorrow or the next day, it can really make a big difference. And pro tip from Lisa, she actually thinks it tastes even better. And I would like to say that it has some extra carbohydrate, but it is not a total no, carbohydrate bond. It's two to one. It's, it's, two two to one. one. Yeah, it's yeah. just a little bit more two carbohydrate. Two grams of carbohydrate. Two yeah. grams of protein to one gram of carbohydrate. Yeah, it's just a little bit more. It's so tasty, too. It's so yeah, tasty. Yeah, there, there is something about that. Again, some additional glutamine, some other things in there that I think are useful for cranking up recovery. And if we're looking at and trying to... We all have become very sophisticated around tracking and we're looking at wattage and outputs. I guarantee you these are the small details that make a big difference, especially when you're trying to go hard in the paint. I think this recovery protein is fantastic. And it's so tasty. Stop Did it. we say that already? It's so Stop tasty. Stop it. It's not about it's tasty. It's about what's good for you, Julia. It's don't so you know tasty. you've been married to me for a long time? I know you don't even care. All right. If you want to learn more, go to livemomentous.com slash... TRS, and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase at, at Momentus. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Element. Look, let's be clear. We literally drink it every day. That's true. But I want to tell you about my use case. We were skiing this weekend, and skiing is one of those weird sports where people go out there, and they're like, let me do a hard sport. I'm getting on the treadmill. I need to drink this water and optimize this. Oh, I'm going skiing all day. I won't drink any water. I won't any <laughs> well, yeah, because if you drink any water before you ski, then you have to like leave the ski hill to go <sighs> use the bathroom. So you just live in dehydration. So one of the things that I think makes a big difference for my skiing is I pound an element and strong. I put it in a little bottle, not a lot of water, like 12 ounces. And that's the last thing I drink before I head to the hill. Yeah, it's like a prehydrate. Like I always yeah. bring one of those in the car too. Like I prehydrate and I get like getting salt. And salts. And yeah. And this is the first time in the day I'm breaking my fast with salts. And so if you're going to engage in a strenuous activity, I ski, strenu ski strenuously, um, I would go ahead and say, try this out. Put an element in 12 ounces of water, and then the, right before you go, it's just a, you can just chug that thing down. I guarantee you're going to feel different and perform differently. Yeah, and I think this strategy could be useful. I mean, we know it's useful for skiing, but I think any sort of activity exactly like right. that where you know that you don't want to drink a lot or can't drink a lot, you know, even on airplane, I think would be a good strategy for this because you know you don't want to drink massive amounts of water and get up 45 times. You know how I go to the I go to parties. And we'll you pre-eat? Pre I yeah. pre-eat the protein. Yeah, yeah. this is pre-elementing? This is pre-elementing. Yeah. And, uh, it's Should we make thing. a hashtag of that? Pre-element. Pre so give it a shot, everyone. If you know you're going to be in a situation where you're not going to be able to drink for a while, give it a shot. It's going to change your life. If you go to an order through our link, 
you get a free sample pack with all of Element's flavors. So go to drinklmnt.com slash TRS. Well, and if I could close the loop, I mean, I do, you know, Kelly and I talk a lot about this too, just in terms of the basic health behaviors we rec- we recommend. And yep. and and I, I do really like the capacity idea because presumably one of the things you're saying is that if you keep an eye on these things and if you're flexible and can, you know, flexible with that in terms of like learning from that data and then flexibly changing your plan and approach, yep. um, you will have more capacity. Totally. And then it just becomes yeah, it's about this, offense, not defense. Yeah, right. We're not doing this to prevent. Right. We're doing this because it opens up next right. level. Because you of can have ability. more, you know, yeah. more connection with your family and friends and you can, you know, show up better at work. And right. It's about having more capacity, which I love that. And I do just want to get into a few tactical questions because I know people will ask, especially on the heart rate variability question. Um, and one of those is. Is it, is the goal for it to be high or is it high for me? Yeah. So it's, a, it's another, it's a great question. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to answer that in two ways because the goal is it for it to be higher, but there's a higher for you. So here's what I mean by that. We have enough data by now. We've got millions of data points on what uh, heart rate variability is looking at. And what Harvard just did a study about three years ago, they combined HRV and VO2 max. And what they found was the higher your HRV, the higher your VO2 max, the further you are away from death, like plain and simple, very easy to understand and and take a look at. Now, if I was to say, if you're 40 years old and you don't have an HRV of 80 to 120, no, it doesn't work that way. It's all very genetically predispositioned. And so there's things that come into this. And so you can't take one data point of heart rate variability and say, oh, this is negative. You have to look at trends, something on a week, something on a month, something on a couple month trend of understanding the season that you're in. And that's going to be something that you always want to make sure is pushing upwards. Now realize that's a super sen- sensitive metric. Last night, for a perfect example, my average HRV for a 36-year-old active, pretty healthy uh, male is 103. That's just what my average is on a typical uh, typical week, living, living a life by design, pretty focused. Well, over the course of the weekend, I was on Pacific time, was out in Arizona, took a flight that brought me home last night, landed at 2 a.m., woke up this morning at 6 to stay on, up, like to get back on circadian rhythm and optimizing that out. Well, when I woke up, didn't get a, lo- a lot of sleep last night and had an HRV of 72 when I woke up. For me, all that states is, hey, didn't get a lot of sleep last night, was eating airport food for uh, at the lounge, which isn't, again, the best. And... Today, when I woke up, I made sure that I was in the sauna first this morning, stretched and got a little bit uh, more dynamic in my warm-ups, and tonight I'll make sure that I'm in bed by 8. And so these are like the decisions that I'm making that tomorrow I'll see that rebound in HRV probably back up into that similar areas. But it's the awareness mechanism that HRV brings to uh, to choices and behaviors we're, we're doing. The biggest one that I see in our clients and people that are doing this is their alcohol intake. They don't realize the impact that alcohol has on any single given night where they're like, oh, I just have a glass of wine every single night. Not a big deal. Well, all of a sudden when they stop utilizing alcohol for two, three, four, five days in a row, they see that their sleep quality goes from 27% to 40%. They see that HRV goes from 50 to 70. And they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it had this big of an impact. And so these are the awareness tools that we start to see in these habits and behaviors that are impacting capacity because we've never had the awareness before. You know, we just had Kristen Holmes from Whoop on the podcast, and I thought one of the most interesting insights that she shared, which, you know, seemed obvious, but I'd never thought of before, is that, you know, none of us have a true baseline, right? Like we haven't been, most of us began tracking this stuff, you know, 
Kelly and I, I don't know, mid thirties, we're 50 now. Um, you know, most of us have lived a life, um, and maybe kind of hammered our bodies a little bit in that early part of our life. Uh, and so we don't really have a true baseline. So I think that, you know, the emphasis on the sort of, okay, you know, here's where you are now and what you've got to watch is the trends. And, and, you know, I think the other point I wanted to make is, is, you know, using it, um, you know, for example, Kelly and I had a crazy weekend, did a ton of hard workouts. We actually barely drink anymore, but we had one drink. And I think my heart rate variability, which is normally around 50, was down to 27. And what that told me is, okay, it's probably not the day that I should go smash myself in a workout. Like, this is a day where I should take a sauna, I should take a walk, I should chill. You also had a two-and-a-half hour, two and a half hour bike and, and a big it, hike. Yeah, so I had, I had smashed myself the day before and had literally one drink. But it's just, you know, that, I think that's how Kelly and I have come to use that information is, you know, it, especially in terms of training or, you know, big decisions we're going to make about how we're going to move our body. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like you, without some of this data, could get to understanding yourself now. I mean, I think everyone could say, Hey, yeah, you didn't get any sleep last night. We, we are in the camp that you need to prove it to us for a while until you really start to see inputs and outputs. Do you feel like you can get to a place where you can feel some of these things and that you, you were like, cause for example, Juliet and I have this thing called desire to train. And I wake up and I'm like, ooh, what am I going to do today? What am I going to train? What, what kind of workouts? Where am I going? Like, and sometimes I wake up and it's, there's no voice. The voice is left. <laughs> and I am always second guessing myself. Mm, I wonder if I just, I'm lazy. And that, I just don't have the motivation. But then the, I, give, I go easy and the next day the voice is back. Like, all right, we're deadlifting and then we're biking and then we're going to hill sprints. And do you have those for yourself and can i get can we train people to be aware because ultimately what we're trying to do is bring consciousness yeah. to our behaviors and i think i can speak for a lot of adults we're just unconscious about inputs and outputs a hundred percent so for me my journey with hrv started when i was 13. um i was 13 years old my father at 12 said son talent will get you noticed but consistency will get you paid and I was like, I just need to become the most consistent version of me. That's what I need to do. How do I do that? And I wanted to understand habits and behaviors. I was reading a medical journal, happened to fall upon this heart rate variability thing. And so at 13, I was wearing a heart rate monitor to sleep and tracking numbers and doing it all manually. Like, just like, <laughs> it was wild. Like, you're talking about a weird kid. Um, it's like, t tell me, tell me, uh, <laughs> tell me you have ADD and autism without actually telling me. Like, <laughs> like right there. And so... At that point, after I started to go through that and get to this level of understanding, at this point today, yes, I, I know my body inside and out. I know when something's wrong. I know when something isn't working the way it's supposed to. And I know the lever to pull in order to get me into a different position. But I would argue that 99% of people have no idea what that is. Because sure, they've sure. never, they, they haven't ever seen a metric that's drove them in that direction. And the problem in our world, I'm going to call it the health wellness performance world is that there's so many metrics being thrown at you throw so many things being thrown at you. And I would even, I, I'll be as bold as to say this as well about the wearable devices, whoop Aura, Apple, they all do this because they're trying to create IP for themselves. They give you regeneration scores, recovery scores, sleep scores, strain scores, like throw the scores out. Get rid of them. They're confusing. It doesn't allow people to understand their own bodies well enough because at a certain point, you, it's, it's all an algorithm. We need to understand if we can draw it down to this simple metric of heart rate variability and understand this thing based upon the habits you're actually leaning into, it's going to ultimately allow you to understand the impact of your choices in such a more... Um, beneficial way where you're going to be able to take exponential strides forward and have this new power, newfound awareness that, that you didn't have before. So you talked about heart rate variability and sleep. Both are subjects we've talked about a ton on this podcast. Um, and then you said the third one, the, the third one that sort of helps us create capacity is the managing these deficiencies at a cellular level. And I will also say we've had lots of, um, 
folks on our podcast who've talked who've talked about and and we're fans of the importance of like you've got to look under the hood you've got to get you've got to get the right blood work you have to get it interpreted by by the right, right people but tell me what you're like how is what you're proposing people do different and what is it yeah so how do people get the data that you're talking about yeah so there's so there's two different things right there's um, there's blood serum testing and then there's cellular testing and when you talk about blood serum testing what ends up happening is that's what our medical system runs. That's what you're going to get through Inside Tracker, 10X Health, a lot, Get Blokes, a lot of these other testing companies. And for me, it's I sometimes push back heavily because a blood serum test simply looks at what's broken. You've got increase in liver enzymes. You've got increase in kidney uh, numbers. You've got uh, high cholesterol numbers. You've got high glucose numbers. Oh, we can throw something at that and fix it. The other thing you're going to look at is vitamin and mineral deficiencies in the serum. But here's the unique part. In the leukocytes, the white blood cells, that's the usable form of the actual vitamin, mineral, and amino acid. And so you can have high levels of vitamin D, high levels of vitamin K, high levels of vitamin A, vitamin C in the serum, but still be deficient at the cellular level. And so... Cellular testing, understanding what you're deficient in at the cellular level is critical to be able to actually give your body the raw materials to do what it's required to do, to function at that optimal level. When you look at the breakdown, chronic stress, mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, body doesn't know the difference, creates chronic deficiencies, which ultimately creates chronic symptoms, chronic symptoms that we as a society have deemed normal, weight gain that's unexplained, energy loss, fatigue, inability to sleep, brain fog, these symptoms we stay within that we just consider normal. So meaning that we're staying in cellular deficiency as well, which leads ultimately to chronic illness. And that's why chronic illness is that leading cause of death at 71%, 95% of which are pre preventable through habit, behavior, and lifestyle change. But we can't get there because we actually don't know those first two layers. We don't know how our body's handling the chronic stress because we don't have a metric like HRV. We don't know how our body's optimized through deficiencies. We don't know what our deficiencies are because we haven't gotten that. And so we live in this space of chronic or um, chronic symptoms. And we just live here and we're like, this is normal. This is what we're, I guess this is where we have to be. And that's what leads to those outcomes. So for a curious person who wants to know, how do they get this test? How do they, how do they get this information? Ownittesting.com. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, it's something that we've, uh, a process that we've really mastered, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's what we were doing at the NHL level with all these guys and creating, um, again, it's, it's not our supplementation is the best. It's truly a custom formulated supplement for you based off of your cellular deficiencies, based off where you are, based off what you're lacking so that we can actually, cause again, remember if you're deficient in vitamin D, you can't just supplement with vitamin D. What are the cofactors? What are the enzymes? What's makes it bioavailable? What brings it from the serum into the cell in a usable form? Uh, there's, it's so complex that, um, that we, I think we try to skirt around that issue sometimes and, and, and try to provide something in a, in a way that isn't actually getting us to where we need to go. And so go ahead, Kelly. Oh, just when we see this sort of, I'm looking at how I'm thinking about how people eat every day. Yep. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, how they move and interact the sleep piece. We're trying to understand the inputs and outputs of those behaviors. Do you think it sort of writ large that there is a greatest opportunity because I, I think that people are like, whoa, I, how do I control all these things? Yeah. And what has been most surprising to you about the behaviors that have, you know, swung the biggest doors? You know, in, you've worked with a lot of people. You coach a lot of high performers. What has surprised you about, let me give you an example. For me, uh, worked with a, a superstar world champion athlete, turns out, his nutrition was the greatest limiter to his sleep and to his, his performance. And that's, that's, I'm just a physical therapist, but I was like, Hey, I, I can't get to the real conversation here. And that was surprising knowing that's part of my, my plan is to make sure we get to those things, but surprising that that's the big, biggest gate kind of limiter. What, what has surprised you and the people that you're working with? Is it, is it really individual or you really tend to see in this day and age, a specific pattern 
where you're like, wow, I had no idea that that was the problem. I don't think there's anything that surprises me anymore, to be honest with you, because <laughs> I've seen it like I've seen it. So I've seen it so often. Like there's the, number one nutrition. Like if we're if we're not talking about nutrition, like honestly, what are we talking about? Like it's it's the fuel that runs us. And the downside, and this is kind of why I gave this example at the beginning, is the argument that everyone's having is especially, and we're not talking about athlete side anymore, like 90% of our business is not the athletic side. Um, it's, it's everybody else. Um, it, it's kind of like 10% of who we, who we serve now. But when you look at this, the conversation that everybody's hearing is, oh, I should eat only meat or, oh, I should only eat only vegetables or, oh, I should eat paleo or I should eat keto or I should eat Mediterranean or I should eat pescatarian. Like, no, what is it for you? And so that's where for me, Kelly, I think if I was to answer your question in terms of what's surprising to me is that what's surprising is that more people are not wanting or asking for or demanding a personalized approach, a personalized solution. And no, that's not getting mm -hmm. a blood test and then having a pre-done PDF for you that you've given to 9,000 other people because it's scalable. And no, that's not getting a meal plan that is chicken, broccoli, and rice because that's what we're supposed to be eating. Let's get, Let's understand what we're deficient in. Let's figure out and actually do the work as a practitioner to understand, okay, what foods actually align with this? What foods are actually going to help reverse a lot of these deficiencies? And then how can we create or formulate something that is going to support the nutritional changes that we're actually leaning into? And the crazy part is, is when you change cellular deficiencies, HRV increases because the body's not under as much stress, not stress that's pull your hair out stress, but the subconscious under the hood stress that's constantly going on. Your body is adapting constantly to things that are going on internally in order just to survive. And so if we're able to, again, eradicate some of that and reverse some of that, it gives us the power and the edge to allow us to sleep better, which then mitigates more stress on our body, gives us more capacity to, to, to go harder. Then if we're training harder, we've now got greater capacity to take on more from a strength standpoint, from a cardiovascular standpoint, from a um, elasticity standpoint, all of these things that we're looking at. And so the, the three prongs that we always lean into, yes, their exercise, yes, their nutrition, yes, their sleep. And if you want to throw a fourth one in there to kind of categorize it, you could say stress management. But at the end of the day, what really matters, what really makes it work is consistency. And how do we make somebody consistent? We give them data to show little wins that drive awareness to go, oh my gosh, I did this last night, my HRV dropped. Man, I don't want to do that again. Or man, I did this and my HRV rose. Gosh, this means it's probably pretty good for me. Yeah. I tested I tested on September this and I did these five changes over the course of the last 3 months and I retested and I saw all my deficiencies drop and I'm feeling better. Wow, I must be doing something that's working. Instead, we keep our head under the sand. We're just like, I'm just going to grab this thing from this guy, this thing from this guy, this thing from this girl, this thing from this Instagram's influencer, and I'm just going to keep going. Well, it's no wonder yeah, things it's press and guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's it pressing guess. Press guess. The clues, yeah, right? Yeah, it's the total pressing guess. And, you know, I just wanted to um, uh, maybe s somehow uh, tee up that this entire time we've actually been talking about all the concepts in your latest book, The Power <laughs> of Ownership, um, but we haven't said as much. Um, so I just I just wanted to tee that up for our listeners that um, pretty much everything we've been talking about are all concepts that you talk about and expand upon in your book, which is awesome, by the way. Congratulations. I appreciate you. Um, one question I do have for you on this heart rate variability piece is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding though, especially for those of us who are training, that you actually are going to want to see, um, you know, dips in your heart rate variability. If you have a hard training session and your heart rate, you know, if, if my average heart rate's 50 and I train hard or I think I train hard and the next day my heart rate variability is still 50, um, can I assume maybe I thought I was training hard and wasn't? I mean, what, what, you know, what variation in this very, in this variation yeah. is, is good and should be expected, especially for people who are moving and using their bodies to train versus people who are just stressed, you mean, and just chronically suppressed. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's no way to tell the difference, but it's, it's a very good question. And this is where 
again, the education piece behind this powerful tool like Whoop or the powerful tool like Aura becomes so important and really what we end up supporting for a lot of people in their journeys. When you're talking about somebody who's like, let's say us, for example, or somebody who's an elite athlete, you're going to have a very different approach and the, a very different answer. I'll take your first, uh, your first approach to the first answer. If you've got a professional athlete or a collegiate athlete or a Olympian, 100% you're going to look at your dip days because you're going to be pushing the envelope in a training session. And that's a stressor. There's a major stressor there that you are pushing the envelope in a big, big way. And you can't start to stack those days because you're just ultimately going to create a valley that's very difficult to come out of or increasing the likelihood or probability of, a, of some type of uh, injury or illness at some point in time. So yes, you do want to see the dips and you want to see yourself come back. When we're talking about, let's just call it us or people who are like your, your uh, corporate athletes or uh athletic aging population. <laughs> oh, you're talking about me again. Yeah, yes, that's us. Um, what we end up seeing is that, remember, I, I need people to really like hold on to this concept and, and allow it to really create that trigger is mental, physical, spiritual, emotional stress. Your body does not know the difference. So as you're taking your kids to college, as you're trying to balance a schedule, as you're worried about the business and the growth and everything that's going on, and then you talk about your hour, hour and a half workout that's going on. I have, I have yet to seen it in studies. I've yet to see it in anecdotal uh, evidence based upon myself that I can actually train hard enough. Even when I was training for the Miami marathon that I just did, I've yet to see it where HRV plummets so heavily simply based upon physical output, but actually it's the two mile or the uh, the fifteen mile run I did. Now, the five podcasts I did on top of that that day, the stress of getting on a plane the next morning and the lack of recovery that I had that failed to give me that jump up again. And so, being aware of these things and the different use cases is is kind of the the thing that I start to really lean on. Does that answer your question? One hundred percent. Thank you. Um, okay, so this would be a question I would normally ask at the beginning, and maybe you've answered it, but I think there might be some little nuggets that you might want to put in there is, you know, I think this is your third, if not fourth book. Um, you obviously have a lot of irons in the fire. Kelly and I being book people know that, um, you know, it's no small task to put together and market a book. You fool. Um, yeah. And um, why this book? Why now? Um, I know you've said that you know, you see what we see, it, which is a massive amount of confusion, mm. fire hose of information, um, poor access to this idea of health to sort of the everyday person. But, you know, are there more, are there more reasons why now? And I'm pausing because I'm trying to figure out what direction to go with this. Are so many people blame the medical system for the, the, the place in which our health is. And I actually defend our medical system often. And I say the medical system is not broken. The medical system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. Fix things that are broken. If I have a foot facing backwards, take me to my doctor. If I have a knee that is no longer- I feel like you've seen a foot facing backwards. I, I have seen one foot in facing hockey. backwards. Yeah, okay. It was, That's a very specific thing. <laughs> yeah, because I was thing. like, that was real specific. Yes, I have seen a foot facing backwards. Um, if I have an appendix that's about to burst, take me to my doctor. And it's also meant to make money. Those two things is what it's designed to do. And it does both of those things very well. Us as a society, we want it to maintain our health. We want it to prevent illness. It's like asking to get apples from an orange tree. It just won't happen. The thing is that we're pushing the responsibility of our health and the maintenance of our health and the prevention of illness on somebody else when actually it's our responsibility. We have to be equipped. We have to take ownership. We have to understand. And so the reason that the book now is because we're in a time where if we don't realize this, it will get very slippery very fast if, it, if we haven't already hit that point. And this is a pattern interrupt and a disruption in culture, a disruption in the moment. Now, in this book, I promise one thing and I hope for another. I promise 
that I will make things simple. I promise that everything we just talked about will all of a sudden hit home through stories. We'll hit home through anecdotes. We'll hit through, we'll hit home through frameworks that you're like, oh my gosh, I can do this. Oh my gosh, I can actually lean in. Oh my gosh, this makes sense for kind of the first time. And my hope for people is that it will give them hope. My hope for people is that it will equip you. My hope for people is that it will empower you to say, man, I'm no longer afraid of this. I'm no longer wanting to push it off. I'm no longer okay having my head under the sand and just living life not knowing. I'm no longer okay guessing. I'm no longer okay copying. I'm no longer okay complying, but rather I need to be customizing what it is that I need to do because that's the way that I prevent illness. That's the way I maintain health. That's the way I go from a male of 72 years of an average age mortality rate to now taking ownership and saying, I'm going to live to 85 and 90 and thrive and not just hope my way there. I have a playbook now. I have data I can run my body off of, just like I run my business, just like I run my financial portfolio, just like I run my real estate portfolio. I look at numbers and I look at data. We wouldn't make random decisions without having the information there and some of these important things. Why not do it for the most important thing that runs everything else? And so my promise is that I make it simple. My promise is that it's information you haven't heard. My promise is that it's all condensed in one place. And it's not about any other agenda other than helping people ultimately take their health to another level and empower you in that way. Because the mission of our business is is to redeem the health of the world through educating, equipping, and empowering you to take ownership of your health so that we can drop that chronic illness rate from 71% to below 50% by the year 2030. And that is as simple and as straightforward as it can get specific I, I, and actionable. I, can I love it. I hear all of the influence and in, in, fitness influencers are sweeping right now as their, as their Instagram account just evaporates. <laughs> Justin, that's <laughs> such a perfect place to wrap with that treatise. Can you tell us where to find the book, where we can find more about you, where you are on the socials? Yeah. So the book is available at the power of ownership book.com. So the power of ownership book.com. And uh, uh, we've just been super blessed with the um, reaction to the book from pre-orders and kind of where we're going. And so um, hoping to chase uh, chase bestseller status like you, Kelly. And um, it's it's just been so cool to see the feedback. And um, so the power of ownership book.com is where you can find that. And then own it coaching is where you can find us. That's where we live. That's where we play uh, at own it coaching. Uh, so own and then uh, myself on uh, on Instagram is at uh, at Justin Roth R O E T H. Awesome, and you know, congratulations on the book. We were lucky enough to get an early copy and got to read it last fall, and then we re reviewed it again for this episode. So, congratulations again, and I hope it all goes super well. And thank you so much for talking with us today. It was really great to hear your perspective and. I think people are going to learn a lot from this episode. Yeah, I, I just, I just love the way that we we do life together, guys. It's uh, we we come from a very similar perspective, and uh, the mission and the heart behind it is is the same. You guys are so pure in how you do things, and uh, I just appreciate you guys for being different. I appreciate you guys for paving the way and being leaders in that space. Um, and uh, and it's just so great to to be aligned with you both. Thanks so much. Thank man. you so much. Thank great you. Great to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at thereadystate.com. And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You got it.